first at nine, this Saturday, the 12th of October, 2024. Weather havoc. Sri Lanka hit by incessant rain and heavy flooding. Over a 70,000 suffer adverse weather. President Disanayaka calls for immediate relief as evacuation warnings for landslides and red alert for strong winds issue. Expedite investigations. Strong instructions to expedite police investigations into seven high-profile cases, including the 2021 Easter Sunday bombings, 2015 Treasury bond auction, and the 2022 suspicious death of businessman Dinesh Shafter. <laughs> Anti-corruption. U.S. aid administrator Samantha Power expresses willingness to support the new government's policy focused on strong anti-corruption actions. Economic transformation. Sri Lanka must implement economic transformation legislation to pave way for investment, highlights World Bank. There's this new Economic Transformation Act. It does lay out a simplified approach, better structure, a much cleaner institu institutional arrangement. Obey Vishwasi Dino Sinsurain, then Lagamati Pharmacy in Labaka the Hacker. Vadima Manape, Janata Terima Mevana. Sudeshi Original Kuhumba Matamai. Hi, I'm Fiza. Are you after all levels? If you are, join our ANC Foundation program. Crunchy goodness for hunger on the go. This is Other Verna First at Nine with Indivadi Amwata. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. And a very warm welcome. You're joining us tonight on First to Nine, your primetime English news service here at Other Derana 24. And we take you straight to the top story making headlines tonight. Sri Lanka is hit by incessant rains and heavy downpour. The latest reports of the Disaster Management Center estimate 76,223 people belonging to 18,796 families are affected by the prevailing adverse weather. President Anura Kumar of the Sanayaka instructed the Ministry of Finance to allocate 50 million rupees to provide immediate relief to the people affected by the current inclement weather. The President also informed government officials to work in a well-coordinated manner to ensure that the relief facilities granted to the people are efficiently distributed. Meanwhile, as heavy downpour and strong gusty winds continue to wreak havoc in several regions island-wide, the Department of Meteorology anticipates that the prevailing heavy rainfall will subside during the upcoming days. Several river basins are inundated due to the persisting downpour across the island for the past few days. According to a report issued by the Irrigation Department, River Kalu had reached a major flood level of 8.02 metres in the Millakanda area. Atwanagalu Oya also surpassed flood levels of 5.74 metres in the Dunamale area this afternoon. River Kalini surpassed a minor flood level in the Nagalagang Vidya and Hangwella water gauges this afternoon, raising the risk of possible floods in some low-lying areas in Colombo. Meanwhile, the Kolonnava, Vellampiti and Kalinimulla areas remain submerged. Ambatale, Malwana and Galwana areas are also experiencing floods. <laughs> Heavy rainfall led to the inundation of the Kahantot area in Malabay and several areas in Bakmigha.
The overflowing of River Kalani has prompted floods in several low-lying areas in Kaduvela, including the Kaduvela interchange of the Southern Expressway. The Road Development Authority meanwhile stated that the Valipanda interchange of the Southern Expressway, which was closed last night due to a minor flood situation, reopened for traffic this morning. Meanwhile, with the increase in the water level of River Kalani, the reading at the Hungwala water gauge increased to 8.8 mm. This led to the inundation of several surrounding low-lying areas including Godapara Godella, Sivali Vatta, Jaivira Goda, Valawatta, Vanaha Goda and Iria Golla. In light of the situation, area residents were evacuated to safe locations. Several areas in Gampaha were flooded today as water levels of the Uruwal Loya and Atanakalu Oya reached major flood levels in the Dunamale area. More locations in Gampa remain submerged owing to the prevailing adverse weather. The Railways Department announced that train services on the Putlam Railway line were disrupted due to flooding. Train services on the route operated only up to Lunuvilla. Meanwhile, River Kalu reached a major flood level in the Millakanda area, inundating the Kaluthara Bandaragama main road. According to the latest situation report of the Disaster Management Centre, 76,223 people belonging to 18,796 families across 11 districts are affected by the prevailing inclement weather. Earlier today, the Ministry of Public Administration, Home Affairs, Provincial Councils and Local Governments said measures are in place to provide immediate relief if the prevailing weather worsens. आरक्षक आमादने चर्च दे पावती ना आपदा कलमना करना आंशिक मागीन उन टावाशे वेना अतिरिक्त प्रतिपादने एंड में वेना कोटा निकुट कल दिए ना इस तक का महाबांडा का रहे सुधान में सीरियना आवश्यक हो हो अतिरिक्त प्रतिपादने से पहिए मट इन्हीं सा जनता वट साहना साले सीम संबंधित कटे तूवल बाद आवाक Northwestern provinces and in Goa and Matra district uh, tonight and tomorrow morning. Also, showers or thunder showers can be expected several places elsewhere in the island. Uh, also, uh, prevailing shower condition we are expecting to reduce uh, gradually from tomorrow onwards. Taking the prevailing adverse weather into consideration, the National Building Research Organization too issued early landslide warnings to areas in eight districts across the island. Later this evening, President Anur Kumar Adhisanayaka instructed officials to provide immediate relief to the people affected by the inclement weather. The President's office said that the President informed the Secretary to the Ministry of Defence to pay special attention to the safety of the people affected and to provide necessary support to provide relief services efficiently. President Dizan Naika, who directed the Ministry of Finance to allocate 50 million rupees for relief services, has further advised government officials to work in a well-coordinated manner to deliver relief to the people. Horizon Campus 2024 Intake 2. Register now. Welcome to Cinnamon Life, South Asia's biggest entertainment hub, where awe awaits. The Ministry of Public Security has instructed the Acting Inspector General of Police, Priyantha Virasurya, to expedite the police investigations into seven high-profile cases, including the 2019 Easter Sunday attacks and the central bank bond scam in 2015. Addressing a media briefing today, police media spokesperson DIG Nihal Taldu was said, the CID has been instructed to assign more officers and expedite the relevant cases. The Ministry of Public Security has instructed the acting IGB to expedite the police investigations of several high-profile cases. The Ministry inquired into the progress of the investigations carried out by the Criminal Investigation Department regarding these cases. Following the assessment, the Ministry ordered to expedite the investigations pertaining to the Central Bank bond scam and Easter Sunday attack by deploying additional officers if necessary. If there are shortcomings, the DIG in charge of the CID has been ordered to take necessary steps steps to eliminate them and expedite the investigations. Sri Lanka's foreign exchange earnings from workers' remittances 
totaled 556.6 million US dollars in September this year. The amount is a marginal decline compared to 577.5 million US dollars recorded in August of this year and an increase compared to 482.4 million US dollars recorded in September last year. Workers' remittances during the first nine months of the year surpassed 4.8 billion US dollars, a 500 million US dollar increase compared to the 4.3 billion recorded during the corresponding period of last year. Now the World Bank says uh, implementing the Economic Transformation Act is a key necessity for Sri Lanka. The piece of legislation was passed in Parliament in July this year, making provisions for a national policy on economic transformation. Addressing media in line with the release of the bank's Sri Lanka development update, the World Bank's senior country economist for Sri Lanka, Richard Walker, was of the view that the Act lays out an institutional arrangement to attract investments to Sri Lanka. Also speaking here, World Bank economist Shruti Laktakia expressed optimism that credit growth in Sri Lanka, currently at subdued levels, could pick up after the upcoming elections. Sri Lanka really needs to try and transform and get onto a high level of growth in a more inclusive and sustainable way. I'll keep emphasizing that. And this is to do with some of the reforms that have started. So you look in the factor markets, the labor market. There has been work to try and consolidate, streamline, improve. You look on the investment side, the investment environment. There's this new Economic Transformation Act. It does lay out a simplified approach, better structure, a much cleaner institutional arrangement to attract and, and support investment. But obviously this needs to be implemented. SOEs, I think this was a bigger agenda that we'd, we'd been supporting. The work started. It's not an easy area, but I think it's a place that given the fiscal risks, given the productivity attributes, given the service delivery, uh, it's certainly an I think everyone agrees that work needs to be done to improve the governance and operation of SOEs. We've talked about female labor force participation, getting women into the workplace. That's critical as well, um, so that everyone in Sri Lanka has sort of equal economic citizenship to be able to contribute to growth and society. And then another important area, again, we can rehash this, is trying to protect the poor and vulnerable, the hit that households have taken. If this is not reversed, of course, this kind of discontent and this weight on the economy and society, the scarring effect will well, certainly wouldn't aid the country staying out of a crisis and moving far from a crisis into a much sort of higher and more sustainable levels of growth. How do you foresee the impact of the continuous elections on the focus? So if you look at the high frequency indicators around business sentiment, they do seem to be doing well. So it does look like businesses are pretty optimistic about the next few months. So we don't expect a very big short-term impact. At the same time, credit growth, for example, has been slow. And we expect that it may pick up once there is completion of the election period, which will resolve uncertainties that firms may have about policy going forward. So I think the policy consistency part is quite important. And if there are reversals there, it may impact the short-term projections, both on the current account and the GDP side through exchange rate and other variables. Sri Lanka's finance companies and insurance sectors have shown signs of resilience this year. Central Bank says this is a result of improved macrofinancial conditions in the financial sector. In its financial stability review for year 2024, the regulator highlighted that credit quality of household sector improved slightly as reflected through the non-performing loan ratio. However, household credit remained at elevated levels, particularly within the non-bank financial institutions sector. In the Central Bank's Financial Stability Review for the year 2024, the Montreal regulator noted that the performance of both finance companies and insurance sectors depicted an overall trend consistent with that of the banking sector, which displayed improved resilience, highlighting the impact of improved macrofinancial conditions within the financial sector as a whole. The central bank highlighted that the household and institutional sectors, which constitute key financial service consumers, recorded an expansion in credit during the first half of this year. According to central bank, 
This reflects the uptick in demand for financial services from these sectors against the backdrop of improving macroeconomic conditions in the economy. However, the debt stock of both sectors remain below the levels observed during the first half of 2022, reflecting the potential for further expansion of credit. It is observed that the decline in interest rates and low inflation environment would have provided impetus towards the expansion in credit, but a low level of real income and tax adjustments would have tapered this growth momentum. Although the credit quality of the household sector improved slightly as reflected through the non-performing loan ratio, it remained at elevated levels, particularly within the non-bank financial institution sector, which holds a higher proportion of NPLs compared to the banking sector. However, the monetary regulator noted that the NPL ratio of the institution sector continued to deteriorate, signaling ongoing challenges in managing the credit quality of financial institutions despite the gradual improvement in macro-financial conditions. In its outlook for the country's financial sector, the central bank stated that challenges will persist as the benefits experienced through the recovery in macro-financial conditions supported by the favorable base effect are diminishing. Further, CBSL highlighted that a higher propensity towards risk-taking during the expansionary phase of the credit cycle is also likely to heighten the build-up of vulnerabilities, highlighting the continued need for proactive risk management within the financial sector. The United States Agency for International Development has assured support to President Anurakumar Adhisanayake on future cooperation, commitment to a shared vision and a policy framework of anti-corruption. During a virtual meeting between USAID Administrator Samantha Power and President Anurad Dusanayake, the USAID has assured support to Sri Lanka in any way needed. The President's office said power expressed willingness to support the Sri Lankan government aligning with the manifesto presented to the people in reference to Anuradha Sanayaka's policy framework focused on strong anti-corruption action. During the mm. virtual discussion between President Anur Kumar Dishanayaka and Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, Samantha Power, avenues for future cooperation were explored. Samantha Power said the USAID is willing to support the government of Sri Lanka in aligning with the manifesto presented to the people. She highlighted USAID's support for Sri Lanka's economic recovery and stabilization following the 2022 crisis, as well as its support for Sri Lankans working to improve governance and reduce corruption. Administrator Power and President Dizanayak underscored the importance of pairing the implementation of strong anti-corruption measures with sustained and inclusive economic growth. Samantha Power also assured the Sri Lankan head of state that the USAID is prepared to support Sri Lanka in any way needed. Sri Lanka Decides 2024 And we take you to your election segment uh, for the upcoming general elections. Former Samagi Janabalavege parliamentarian Ajit Mana Peruma has decided to withdraw from the parliamentary election despite being included in the SJB's nomination list. Addressing a media briefing, Mana Peruma stated that this abrupt removal from the position of SJB Gampaha electorate organizer was the reason for his decision. Even though the Samagi Janabalavege included me as one of its candidates, I decided to refrain from contesting. I speak with extreme disappointment regarding the party's leader Sajid Premadasa. During my tenure as the Gampa electorate organizer, I served as mayor for nine years and as a provincial council member for four years. I was also a parliamentarian for the Gampa district for 12 years. I was truly disappointed when, within 24 hours of signing my nomination papers, the party stripped me of my position as the Gampa electorate organizer without informing me and gave it to someone who didn't even support Sajid Premadasa but was a supporter of Ranil Vikrama Singer. I have decided not to support a leader who refuses to answer me and acts in a cowardly manner. Therefore, I will not contest the upcoming election even though my name is still on the party's nomination list. I am shocked to realize that I campaigned to elect a cowardly leader as the president and I would like to apologize to the citizens. I must add that Sajid Premadasa is apprehensive of educated individuals. Leader of the Sarvajana Balaya and Gampaha district candidate for the alliance, Dilit Jayavira highlighted that his alliance's goal of establishing a powerful opposition in the country assured that they would not repeat the mistakes of past oppositions. Addressing a media today, Dilit Jayavira highlighted that Sri Lanka's economic development can only be ensured through a government centered around 
the concept of entrepreneurship. A meeting with the candidates of the Sarvajana Balay Alliance who are running for the upcoming general election was held today under the patronage of the Gampa district candidate of the Sarvajana Balay Alliance, Dilit Javira. The meeting saw the attendance of all candidates representing the 22 districts and the candidates from national list for the 2024 general election. The concept of entrepreneurship is capable of driving the country towards economic growth. There is no other solution to develop this country. It is imperative that we create an entrepreneurial mindset in everyone from small-scale entrepreneurs to central government officials. However, the country's government should also be centered around entrepreneurship for the country's future development. However, we are currently in the process of creating an opposition. For the first time in the country's political history, I am saying that we want to form an opposition. We want to establish a civilized political culture in the country. We are here to transform the country's politics. In order to establish a strong opposition in the country, it is crucial that we don't make the same mistakes as the ministers of previous governments. A powerful opposition will never remain as the country's opposition. We need to establish a courageous opposition in the country. However, those involved in theft, corruption and fraud decided not to join the opposition as a courageous opposition cannot be formed with such individuals. Former parliamentarian Field Marshal Sarath Fonseca states that he decided not to contest the parliamentary election due to the failed discussions with both the National People's Power and the New Democratic Front. With that, let's take a look at views presented in the political arena during the day. If you take all of the districts that are represented in the parliament, we have the strongest team. They can work and have sufficient experience. We are not contesting for the power of the government. Give the power of the government to President Anur Kumar Adhisanayaka's party, National People's Power. But we want a strong opposition. You can create the opposition leader from our party. <laughs> with the votes we earned on 21st of September, not only we created a president, but we also managed to defeat the corrupted politicians with those votes. Those votes also helped us to get rid of some nominations as well. By exercising your vote on the 14th of November, you can give the parliament's majority to national people's power. I believe that the public kept the leader of the Samagjana Balavege in the right place and I'm happy about that. I had a discussion with President Anur Kumar Disanayaka on the parliamentary election. During that discussion, the president said they do not allow candidates who previously did not contest under their party. I also had discussions with the former prime minister and former ministers as well. I talked to some politicians who are contesting under the symbol gas cylinder, but I was not interested about their political journey. After those discussions, I decided not to contest the upcoming general election. <laughs> Decides 2024. Fast track your career from O levels with eSoft. Kaget preet from Melbourne biscuit then say it the axini adwin. Rasu than the clata the harisho. Karuan kena e taram hitan anisai. Langali amala vishwasin. Melbourne kirima denne. Welcome back. We take you to business news now. The Colombo Stock Exchange said it will allow companies with below investment grade rating to sell and list stocks to qualified investors who are able to manage riskier assets. 
CSC said in a statement that only specific types of companies, such as those regulated by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka or the Insurance Regulatory Commission of Sri Lanka, are eligible to issue these high-yield bonds. Now, this ensures that regulated entities, including banks, non-banking financial institutions and insurance companies, can participate in the new financing opportunity. Trading will occur on the high-yield debt, will be allowed on an over-the-counter platform and will be restricted qualified investors. These investors, the CSC said, similar to those in Basel III compliance securities, are typically more experienced in managing risks. They have the opportunity to diversify their portfolios by investing in bonds that offer potentially higher returns but come with increased risk as they often manage portfolios with a broader risk appetite. Earlier, only companies with rating one notch above investment grade were allowed to list debt. John Keels Holdings PLC concluded its rights issue, raising 27.43 billion rupees, exceeding the initial target of 24.04 billion rupees. The company initially offered 150.26 million new ordinary shares at 160 rupees per share on a 1 for 10 basis, with the proceeds intended to support the City of Dreams Sri Lanka Resort Development Project. The fund will be directed towards Waterfront Properties Private Limited, a subsidiary of the John Keels Holdings, for developing the integrated resort project. In addition to the rights issue, the director of uh, bo director board of the John Keels Holdings has also proposed a share subdivision, which will increase the number of shares tenfold, enhancing liquidity and making the stock more accessible to a wide range of investors. The subdivision will take place after the rights issue and will raise the total number of shares to over 16.5 billion of rupees. And in corporate affairs, Sri Lanka's LTL Holdings said it will pay interest to applications or applicants of an initial public offer which was halted by the Securities and Exchange Commission pending an interim court order. LTL also announced that applications already made could be withdrawn or kept till a fresh date for opening of the IPO is decided. With that, let's take a look at a few corporate affairs in brief. LTL Holdings announced that it will pay an interest of 10.49% to applicants of the initial public offering, which was halted by the Securities and Exchange Commission pending an interim court order. The IPO was initially halted pending disclosure of matters including a court case. The hearing of the court case and possible interim relief is due on the 11th of October. In the meantime, Sunshine Healthcare Lanka Limited, the healthcare arm of Sunshine Holdings PLC, announced the conclusion of the approximately 3.27 billion rupee equity investment from the International Finance Corporation, a member of the World Bank Group. This investment strengthens the vision of Sunshine Healthcare Lanka Limited to expand healthcare accessibility and bolster innovation across Sri Lanka. Following the completion of this transaction, IFC now holds a 14.73% equity stake in Sunshine Healthcare Lanka. In other corporate news, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of TESS Agro PLC, Dilshan Fernando, says that the company is committed to investing in a solar-powered canning factory, contributing towards the reduction of carbon emissions. This initiative further contributes to a circular economy and promotes responsible consumption. The company chairman also highlighted that the company recorded a turnover of 107 million rupees compared to the previous year. Taking you to international business affairs, global aerospace company Boeing has decided to lay off its workforce by a tenth, cutting 17,000 jobs. The manufacturer of commercial jetliners will also delay production as the company deals with issues across its businesses. The company continues to lose money as it tries to deal with a strike that is crippling production of its best-selling planes. The business warns of a record $5 billion in losses in the third quarter and its chief executive told employees in an email that jobs are all at risk. 
The business also warned of losses in its weapons and military equipment manufacturing arm and pushed back the delivery date of its best-selling plane. A month-long union strike at Boeing has grown contentious as approximately 33,000 workers sought a better pay package. Talks have appeared to fall apart this week amid the company facing mounting pressure with about $60 billion in debt. Well, that wraps up tonight's edition of First at Nine. I'm Indivari Amuatha. We'll see you again tomorrow at the same time. Good night.